Barbuda is a mangled wreck, completely destroyed. A Caribbean island flattened by Irma braces for more destruction with a second powerful storm bearing down. Good evening, I'm Susan Bonner and this is The National. The monumental damage so far and Florida's frantic rush to outrun a hurricane. An earthquake kills dozens in Mexico. Ontario makes pot sales a government monopoly. We ask about black market dangers. We want a clear answer that uh, our identity is safe. Plus, a huge heist of personal data leads to frustration. It was like this for half an hour. Hurricane Irma is driving relentlessly towards South Florida this hour, landfall just a day away. It's left destruction and despair in its wake, and there's more devastation in its sights. Five and a half million Floridians are now doing what so many others in the region could not, fleeing. From small coastal towns to sprawling Miami, they're getting out while they can. But for those who won't go, a stark warning. Don't call 911. No help will come. From above, satellites reveal something not seen in years. Three active hurricanes at once. Cadia hitting Mexico's east coast as the country reels from a deadly earthquake on the west coast. And Jose looming menacingly. But it's Irma's deadly course we're focusing on first. Stephen D'Souza begins our coverage with the latest on those who have already felt its wrath. From the British Virgin Islands to the Dominican Republic to the Bahamas, Irma has blasted across the Caribbean. On St. Martin, the storm has passed and now they're taking stock of the damage. Entire neighborhoods look like this. Where to begin picking up the pieces when your entire life is a mass of broken wood and debris? It is devastating. This is, uh, this is like Hiroshima after the bomb. Canadian René Le Pen lives on the island. He says law and order has broken down. Men are roaming the streets with machetes, looting homes and stores. It has fallen into anarchy and they are raiding some neighborhoods and just going through homes and pilfering. In some areas, Dutch Marines are now patrolling the streets and a curfew has been put in place. But it's a psychological thing uh, that happens anywhere in the world following a major disaster like this. People become uh, kind of hopeless and there is no communication. Today, the Dutch military was able to reach students, including a number of Canadians, sheltered at the American University of the Caribbean. The situation there was deteriorating, with overcrowding and food and supplies running out. I have a recording just to get some of this, uh, damage here. Flying above it all is Canadian charter pilot Wade Fleet. He's been helping the Dutch bring in troops and supplies into St. Martin. It, it looks like if you took a box of toothpicks and sort of threw it on the floor, that's kind of what, when you see it from the sky, that's what you're seeing, what used to be houses, that's what they look like. He says the biggest concern in the region now is the next hurricane, Jose. So he and other relief workers are trying to help as many as they can before that storm hits. On Barbuda, the island is now practically deserted. Irma decimated nearly every structure. And with Jose on its way, shell-shocked residents were told to leave. I don't know. I'm just waiting to get evacuated from here and then I'm going to come back and try and salvage something and help. I don't know. My whole life is here, so... We're not coping. We're definitely not coping. Everybody will tell you the same, they're not coping. Everyone is in the same situation and nobody can help one another. Barbudans left their shattered homes behind and are now sheltering on their sister island, Antigua. Unsure when they'll be able to return and what, if anything, will remain. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Irma has not just broken these Caribbean islands, it has blinded them too. And in the British Virgin Islands, that chaos is leaving many feeling lost, including Nick Kanna. He told us his story earlier today. 
Uh, it's life changing. There's there's uh, there's nothing that can compare to this. Um, so uh, it's been a, a roller coaster of emotions. Who know? Like one second you think you're going to be fine, the next your roof blows off you and you're huddled in a shower uh, with with triplets and two cats and five friends <laughs> and your wife. Uh, so. I don't think there's anything in life that can prepare you for that sort of moment. Right now, it's really about um, some people are evacuating who have nothing, like myself. Uh, my house is gone. My car is gone. All of my clothes, b- belongings, uh, same with my wife, same with the, the group we were with who completely lost their house. I mean, when I say lost, I mean, it's it's scattered across the road behind their where their house used to be. The more people see it, the more people can help. And this place is devastated. You know, I'm guessing 90% of the houses on these hills are, there's no roof on them. I am sure that the government is involved. Uh, uh, I know BVI, uh, Department of Disaster Management, has been very active on social media, but it's spotty because not everybody has a uh, connection. Radio has been out, um, so not many people have been able to hear what's going on. There could be people up in the hills that still think uh, the roads are impassable. So I think it's it's gonna be a few days before uh, a plan comes together because I mean, I've seen like two police this whole, the whole time. I haven't seen any fire trucks out. It's people, it's the community that's coming out and they're, they're gonna rebuild it. And it's gonna take how long it takes, but it's gotta be done. As you saw, another island decimated by Irma and now has Hurricane Jose banging on its doorstep is Barbuda. That country's prime minister, Gaston Brown, spoke with us right after he toured the devastation. Prime Minister, what did you see in Barbuda? Well, I was uh, in Barbuda this morning and from what I've seen on the ground, Barbuda is a mangled wreck, completely destroyed. In fact, it's not about repairing buildings anymore. It's about rebuilding practically 95% of the buildings in Barbuda because even those that are still standing, they are structurally unsound. The island is uninhabitable and we have been evacuating the residents. When I left there about an hour and a half ago, we had perhaps about maybe 150 individuals remaining. And I believe by now they would have been all evacuated from the island. What was that like for you as an experience to survey this, to see this? Well, I had the first experience of seeing the carnage two days ago, uh, literally a few hours after the hurricane would have passed. And I have to tell you, initially it was, I'd say, emotionally painful and uh, I have to admit that I may have even underestimated at the time the extent of the damage because it was really an aerial survey. But being on the ground as recent as today and having done a survey of the damages, I can tell you it is monumental. I've never seen any such disaster on a per capita basis that is extensive as this uh, Babu disaster. How worried are you about the next hurricane coming at you? Very worried, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we also agreed to ensure that there was a mandatory evacuation. Prime Minister, do you have any words of warning for the people in Florida? Absolutely. Uh, What I'll say to everyone in the Caribbean, in Florida, that a hurricane is not a system to be taken lightly. Uh, These systems could be very deadly. In fact, I tell you this much. If the individuals in Barbuda had not heeded the warnings, which were as far back as last Friday, a week ago, to batten down and to prepare fully for this this, um, hurricane, I can assure you that the carnage would have been far worse. We would have had more fatalities, and I'm pretty sure that we would have had uh, more injuries as well. Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Those warnings are not lost on Floridians. They know what's coming. Some are using every last moment to secure property before heading out, while those who can't leave dig in as best they can. Susan Ormiston reports from Miami. 
the last chance to try and dull the devastating impacts of Irma. Albert Castro is attempting to save a fitness studio here in Miami Beach. But here's the problem that I told the owner. We're great here, but look there. On either side, shop windows uncovered. Look at those bombs ready to go off. Got hundreds of coconuts. When those coconuts hit those windows, it's going to blow the whole thing out. Most residents have now left Miami Beach under a mandatory evacuation order. But a few remain seemingly immune to repeated warnings for what Florida's governor calls a nuclear storm. Anywhere in the state, if you're told to evacuate, leave, get out quickly. It's hard to imagine now, but within 24 hours, this will be near the heart of Hurricane Irma. And people here in Miami are worried about three things. Rain up to 20 inches, winds in excess of 100 miles an hour, but mostly about the surge. All this water along the coast surging onto shore up to 10 feet is projected. Look at all these condos along the waterfront. And here's another hazard, construction cranes. Fuel is running out. As of tonight, gas will not be resupplied to South Florida this weekend. Miami shutting down. Residents urged to stock up three days of provisions. Alex is delivering bread up to the last minute. He thinks staying put is the best choice now. Even if I, I take my car and, you know, go north as far as I can, uh, eventually the hurricane is going to get us, it's going to hit us, and I'd rather be at home than in the middle of the highway. It's certain now that Irma will pound South Florida. It's breadth wider than the state itself. It's power unforgiving. Mango's restaurant has weathered a few hurricanes and upgraded to storm-proof windows. Even those aren't enough. The options are slim now. Flee to the north in an historic exodus or hunker down. Irma's coming and there's no escaping it. Susan, the winds have already picked up. The rain has come. Authorities are urging people here to have their hurricane plans in place tonight. They want to minimize movement tomorrow because by midday Saturday, we're expecting tropical force winds, more rain and the surge just like this. So in effect, this monster storm is upon us. Susan, thank you. That's Susan Ormiston tonight in Miami. Let's go to CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. She is nearby in Coral Springs. Johanna, how about Herma tonight? Any stronger today? Well, Susan, the center of Irma has been fluctuating today. It's about 500 kilometers that way from where I'm standing, uh, tracking just north of Cuba. And it has been fluctuating as it goes through an eyewall replacement cycle. So outer thunderstorm rings moving in. That's why it weakened to a Category 4. Now it may strengthen over the next 12 hours. What is crucial is the interaction between the eye of Irma and Cuba. That may end up tearing it apart a little bit, but most forecast models, the latest this run's just coming out. Actually put it at a strong four, if not five, before landfall, Susan. And give us the news of what we can expect this weekend. Well, uh, as we heard, things are already beginning to start to deteriorate. I'm feeling the winds here uh, just inland from Fort Lauderdale. These are the outer bands of Irma. We're actually seeing the first spirals of clouds make their way on shore into the southern sections of Florida. And as I mentioned, those models continuing to shift Irma westward. It looks like landfall will happen Saturday overnight into early Sunday morning in the Florida Keys before tracking inland, uh, basically crossing the peninsula from south to north, slightly towards the west side. So not only will the east side of the peninsula see a strong storm surge, the west might also as well. But we'll watch for these winds to continue to pick up through the day tomorrow. Sunday, pretty much all of Florida will be feeling hurricane force winds. Susan? Johanna, thank you. The third hurricane in the region, Cadia, is slamming the eastern coast of Mexico. And it's not the only disaster the country is dealing with. At least 60 people are dead after an earthquake struck late last night. It's described as the strongest to hit Mexico in a century. Kim Brunhuber has more on that. 
It struck under the Pacific Ocean, 120 kilometers off Mexico's southern coast, while most were still sleeping. Magnitude 8.1, shallow and fairly close to land, a devastating combination. Dozens are dead, many more are missing. Rescue teams dug through the rubble, hoping to find survivors. This morning, thousands of residents pick through their belongings, trying to salvage what they can. It was all horrific, says Maria Lopez. Everything collapsed, everything. The force of the quake was so strong, even more than 900 kilometers from the epicenter in Mexico City, millions were shaken awake. The capital's iconic Angel of Independence statue swayed from side to side. Buildings, too. In the words of one resident, gone soft like chewing gum. When asked what happened, the answer lies all around him. The roof fell off, he says simply. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto says fully assessing the damage may take days, but warned of aftershocks. Many in the country's interior are thankful the quake wasn't closer to the capital, like the one in 1985 that killed thousands and flattened hundreds of buildings. Since then, building codes have been upgraded. After this quake, structures that might have otherwise fallen still stand. A very different picture in the coastal states of Oaxaca, Tabasco and Chiapas, those closest to the epicenter where some of Mexico's poorest areas were hit hardest. Some hospitals have lost power, which killed a child on a respirator. In Oaxaca, a family gathers around a loved one who died in the rubble. According to Alma Jimenez, her town is already running out of coffins. We are holding a vigil for her here, she says, because we went to purchase her coffin, but there are none left because of how many people were killed. On social media, a girl begs for help, for more hands to dig. Somewhere under the piles of wood and stone, she knows her friends are still there. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Coming up, a stern rebuke for the maker of the life-saving EpiPen. Plus, a far-right group raises concerns in Quebec. You'll see how it won a PR war. We made a point. We made our point. As we first reported last night, Ontario unveiled its plans for legalized marijuana. The minimum age to buy, possess, or use will be 19. You can only use it in private residences, and you can only buy from government storefronts, which effectively ices out other businesses from the industry. Havard Gould has more on that. Anya Siloom was forced to shut down her illegal marijuana dispensary, and when the sale of recreational marijuana becomes legal next year, she won't be allowed to get back into the business. It's a monopoly. They're just trying to get as much money as they can. In Ontario, only the government will be allowed to sell non-medical marijuana, assuming legislation goes through starting July 1st next year. In Ontario, anyone 19 or over will be able to buy marijuana in dozens of new, freestanding stores run by the Provincial Liquor Control Board. But the stores won't look anything like this. In small, marijuana-only stores, the product will be treated like tobacco, kept behind counters. Ontario says it is determined to drive dealers and illegal shops out of business with strict enforcement and by locating its new marijuana stores near where illegal dispensaries have popped up. We want to send a signal to the marketplace that distribution and retail is going to be a controlled model. It's going to be controlled by the government. Another part of that control, the government says, will be keeping prices low enough to encourage people to buy marijuana legally. But some believe Ontario's plans will fall apart immediately. Your lineups are going to be ridiculous. People are not going to go stand in line for four hours to get low-grade legal cannabis when they can just call their regular drug dealer that they've been calling for 20 years. If it's overly restrictive, I think people will just opt out. This expert also believes Ontario's strategy will fall apart, just not as quickly. I think that they'll they'll try for a few years and fail, and, and in in you know in a decade or so they'll they'll come around to a, a more reasonable. Um, system that's probably not unlike what we see with craft breweries and wineries. But Ontario also plans to make buying pot convenient by selling it online to be delivered to Ontario addresses only. The province says it doesn't know how much money it will make selling marijuana or even whether it can get enough from approved producers to satisfy demand. Havard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. 
As you saw, there's fierce pushback to keeping the sale of marijuana to standalone government-run stores. Earlier today, I asked Ontario's Attorney General why the province chose to do that. Minister, why go this route? We've been working on this for some time since federal government announced uh, their intention to legalize marijuana. We've been talking to Ontarians, we've consulted them, we've been talking to law enforcement, public health advocates and community organizations and the overwhelming advice that we receive is, is, to, is to sell uh, uh, sell cannabis through a controlled government model and to take a safe and, and sensible approach to legalization and align our rules as much as possible to uh, that that exists for alcohol and tobacco. So that's why for minimum age, places of use, et cetera, that's the approach we're taking. But what do you say to the businesses who have invested so much getting ready for this moment and they've built they've built themselves up and now they're left out? Uh, well, you know, again, uh, you know, federal government uh, has created a certain model around uh, legalization and they have said up to the provinces to decide what is the, what is the retail and distribution model is going to be. We have uh, uh, LCBO that has a tremendous expertise uh, in, in terms of social responsibility and, and, and good customer uh, uh, service and we we have felt based on the advice we have received that that is the most safe and sensible approach to take uh, uh, to ensure that uh, cannabis is being sold either by retail stores or through online uh, in a manner where social responsibility and protecting our youth and prevention and harm reduction remains uh, the number one priority. How worried are you that a black market might develop since this if this stays in government hands, that a black market will develop to drive the price down? Uh, you know, we've got a, a bit of a two-prong issue. We, we cannot have a price too high to, to encourage illicit market, or we cannot price it too low that encourages the use uh, of cannabis either. So it's a fine balance, and I know the ministers of finance, both federally and of provinces and territories, are working very closely in determining what those, the right price point and taxation level is going to be on this product. The day after we learned about one of the biggest cyber attacks of private financial information, the Canadian branch of Equifax still doesn't have any more answers for people here than it did yesterday. But as Rene Filippone tells us, that doesn't mean Canadians didn't have their details hacked. Jamie Horowitz is frustrated and worried. After logging on to the Equifax site today, he discovered his wife's account may have been compromised. Personal information may have been impacted. He created accounts with the credit checking agency recently after his wife's purse was stolen. The police and Visa suggested that we, you know, join Equifax or, or start an account there for uh, identity theft alerts. Now the company they paid to warn them of danger is the one putting his family's finances and identity at risk. That is their business, that's what they sell. It's the epitome of irony. Nearly 143 million accounts were compromised in the U.S. starting in late May. It took the company until July to discover the hack and another month to inform the public. Canadians were also hit. Equifax Canada won't say how many or what information was compromised and provided no statement today. We don't know yet what the extent is, but the fact that in the U.S. they actually accessed everything that the criminals need to commit full-on identity theft, crimes in your name, like you said, social security numbers, that would be our social insurance number in Canada. The, the Canadian government says it's taking the breach seriously and that there need to be consequences. Canadians have every right to, uh, to believe uh, and believe accurately that their privacy is, uh, is properly safeguarded. Security experts say Canada should take a close look at the tough rules on the way in the European Union. For the first time, it actually holds sites accountable for data loss. And not even, you know, I'm not even talking about, you know, your credit card number. I'm talking anything that can identify you as an individual. People are being told to keep an eye on their bank accounts and credit card statements and to sign up for credit monitoring with companies including Equifax themselves, frustrating people even further. We want a clear answer that uh, our identity is safe and possibly a refund of all our fees and we'll cancel our accounts and, and get rid of all our information. Horowitz says he Good just sir. wants out. The company wasn't answering his calls today, but says it has added staff to deal with the breach. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. British Columbia's Jassy Sidhu was murdered 17 years ago, and today the Supreme Court of Canada ruled her mother and uncle can be extradited to India to face charges. 
Indian officials say Sidhu was the victim of a so-called honor killing for marrying a man her family didn't approve of. Greg Rasmussen has the story. The love story turned tragedy struck a nerve in Canada and overseas. 25-year-old Jazzy Sidhu from Maple Ridge, B.C. was murdered on a visit to India in 2000. Her husband was left for dead, but survived. There is no honour in this particular murder. Indian authorities called it an honour killing, accusing Sidhu's mother, Malkit Kaur Sidhu, and uncle, Surjit Singh Badesha, who they say were enraged over the young woman's secret marriage to an impoverished rickshaw driver. End, what matters For some who've closely followed the case, today's decision took too long, but is a relief. It does send a very clear message to the young women that in Canada, uh, this kind of murder will not be tolerated, and there are no exceptions to the rule. Today's Supreme Court decision hinged on confidence in India's justice system, and the court ruled it was sound and there was no substantial risk of torture or mistreatment. Human rights groups had argued India's justice system falls short of Canadian standards, and the two accused faced the possibility of torture. Because this whole issue of concerns about what fate awaits these people in India would be avoided entirely if um, they were prosecuted in Canada. The only faint hope now for the accused, a last-minute reprieve from the Justice Minister. I do not think I should comment any further because I will likely or potentially could be making determinations on this case sometime in the future. This author of a book about the case spoke to the survivor of this tragedy who lost his newlywed wife. Mitu Sidhu remains in India. He will still be the primary witness in this trial, should there be a trial. And he's fearful for his life. Now, 17 years after the killing, both the accused are now in custody, awaiting extradition. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Straight ahead, the makers of the life-saving EpiPen are under fire for how they handled a recall. It's a long way from the Elma combo indeed for this Dublin band. On its first visit to Toronto, U2 drew barely 50 people to the Macombo's neon palms on Spadina Avenue. But while the crowds have grown, the message of U2 remains the same. It's a band that preaches social change, and their latest song, Pride, carries that banner. It's about Dr. Martin Luther King, one of the world's many peacekeepers, shot down in the line of duty in the name of love. U2's singer is Bono Vox, not your average 1980s Bob Dylan, but a 24-year-old who says he's only writing songs about the things he cares about. How dare a, a white Irish rock and roll band write a song about a black martyr in, in the Reverend Martin Luther King? Well, there is a logical reason for that, if you look through it. See, the struggle in our own country, in Northern Ireland, the struggle between Protestants and Catholics um, has made me sick for a long time. And um, I often wondered what it would have been like had we have had a man the caliber of Martin Luther King. It's a result of songs like Pride that U2 is getting noticed around the world. Bono Vox says it's because they play good music. But he also knows the people are listening to his lyrics. We have people from all walks of life. and. For that hour and a half, they're united. Bono says U2's message is getting through even when the band plays Europe or Japan, countries that don't speak English. Because even if the audience doesn't understand the words, it will understand the music. Detroit police got a serious test of their driving skills and physical fitness today. A suspect connected to a murder investigation led officers on a wild chase across the city. After they boxed in his car, he took them on a foot race. When they corralled him again, he went for higher ground. A minivan roof is apparently not high enough, however. Police wrestled him down and into custody. The U.S. government has made strong accusations against the maker of the EpiPen. 
The FDA says Pfizer knew about malfunctions in its auto injectors, but did nothing to fix the problem. And it says people died. Vicodopia has more. It's the shot that can mean the difference between surviving a severe allergic reaction and dying from anaphylactic shock. So when the manufacturer discovered some EpiPens failed to work, it issued a voluntary recall back in March. But the results of inspections by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration suggest there was and still is a serious problem. In a warning letter sent to the maker Pfizer this week, the FDA states the company knew about the potential defects three years ago. Your own data show that you received hundreds of complaints that your EpiPens failed to operate during life-threatening emergencies, including some situations in which patients subsequently died. The seven-page letter says bluntly that the company repeatedly failed to investigate the problem and fix it. This health law professor questions why regulators left it up to the company to voluntarily issue a recall. Health Canada had exactly the same responsibility as the FDA to put a plan on Pfizer of how to deal with consumer complaints and to bring about a recall when those complaints were serious. This allergist regularly prescribes EpiPens to her patients. In spite of the disturbing details by the FDA, she says the injectors are still crucial. I think it would be tragic if it made people less likely to carry the number one, meaning first-line treatment for anaphylactic reaction, which is epinephrine in the form of an auto-injector. As for Pfizer, the company denies it knew of hundreds of EpiPen failures and insists it only knows two cases when they didn't work and the patients were fine. We really are confident in our products, but uh, we understand the concerns and we continue to be committed to working with the FDA and with regulators globally. While the FDA says Pfizer has recalled its defective EpiPens, it's giving the company until the end of the month to fix its problems with production or face legal action. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. The UN now says more than a quarter million people have fled Myanmar in the past two weeks, crossing the border into Bangladesh to escape a military crackdown against Rohingya Muslims. Today, Desmond Tutu added his voice to other Nobel Peace Prize winners, asking fellow laureate Aung San San Juji to keep the violent killings. Tutu wrote, My dear sister, if the political price of your ascension to the highest office in Myanmar is your silence, the price is surely too steep. Malala Yousafzai has asked Suji to take action. And today, the Dalai Lama also urged those who are harassing Muslims to remember Buddha. Buddha helping, definitely help to those poor Muslims. So still I feel that. So very sad. 400,000 people have signed a petition calling for Suji to be stripped of her Nobel Peace Prize. Coming up, Justin Trudeau's warm welcome and what happens next. You guys are under arrest for having crossed things the border illegally. Do you understand? How Canada became a beacon for asylum seekers. Plus, Inuit helped locate the lost ships of the Franklin Expedition. Now they keep the sunken wrecks safe from harm. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX lost 39 points. The dollar increased one-tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow edged up slightly and the price of oil decreased $1.61.
Justin Trudeau came to power on a promise to bring in thousands of Syrian refugees. It's widely seen as a policy victory. But with so many people around the world seeking asylum and thousands landing on Canada's doorstep, border security has become an emotional issue. In a moment, we'll focus on a far-right group in Quebec that wants to put a stop to illegal border crossings. But first, let's get up to speed on how we got to this point. This summer story actually began back in January when Donald Trump announced the so-called Muslim travel ban. We only want to admit those into our country who will support our country and love deeply our people. A tweet in response from Justin Trudeau made headlines around the world. To those fleeing persecution, terror and war, Canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Welcome to Canada. It was shared and liked more than a million times. Some Canadians quoted it with pride as stories began to emerge of Muslims avoiding travel to the United States or being turned away despite having legitimate documents. But feelings about that tweet would change in ways no one could imagine at the time. In May, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security extended its Temporary Protected Status, or TPS, program for some 58,000 Haitians. They had been allowed to stay in the U.S., spared from deportation, 
since the 2010 earthquake that devastated the island nation. But the U.S. warned come January 2018, they could be sent back. By definition, TPS is temporary. So they should start thinking now about uh, what will happen in the not too distant future. That's exactly what thousands of Haitians living in Florida began to do. At the end of July, Haitians began crossing into Canada at an irregular crossing near Le Col, Quebec. Sneaking in because of the safe third country agreement between Canada and the United States. It states that people cannot make a legitimate refugee claim in Canada from the U.S. because Canada considers the U.S. a safe country. You guys are under arrest for having crossed the border illegally. Do you understand? But since Trump was elected, many refugees say they no longer feel safe there. So they're looking north. They are afraid of what is going on in the United States and they know that the administration is not very sympathetic to their cause. So they say they are, you know, trying to, to, to seek somewhere else to live. People who cross irregularly don't do that just for the pleasure or because of misinformation. They do it because they know that if they cross irregularly, the Safe Third Country Agreement does not apply to them. It began as a trickle, but by the end of August, more than 7,000 had arrived. I found that Canada was the best option for me and my family. Unlike in the United States, you treat people as human beings. To cope, Montreal turned the Olympic Stadium into a temporary shelter for 1,500 people. A week later, a rare sight in this country, the military began building a refugee camp. Heated tents to shelter another 500 asylum seekers, it still wasn't enough. The following week, officials had to start moving arrivees 150 kilometers down the road to a conference center in Cornwall, Ontario. The asylum seekers may have been able to get into Canada, but there was no guarantee they'd be able to stay. It depends on the particular circumstances. So first thing you need to look at is, do they have a well-founded fear of persecution today in Haiti? And if they do not, if they're afraid of poverty and destitution or high crime, most likely they'll be refused refugee status. But with the numbers of irregular crossings only increasing, it was a political issue too. The Prime Minister was accused of causing the problem himself. It was all about that January tweet. Maybe he wanted to play the cool guy on the, uh, on the world stage, but uh, it was uh, partly a false message to send. Man, was that ever irresponsible. Canadians are split on the issue. Just over half of those surveyed in late August said the PM's messaging has been unclear. Slightly more than that disapproved of the Trudeau government's handling of the situation overall. Our organization recommends to the government that they suspend the Safe Third Country Agreement. And if Canada were to suspend the agreement, then it would certainly be absolutely true that there is no advantage in crossing irregularly. And it would be much easier for the government of Canada to manage because people would present themselves in, a, in an orderly way at the ports of entry. As the pressure mounted, Trudeau tried to walk back the tweet. You will not be at advantage if you choose to enter Canada irregularly. You must follow the rules, and there are many. Merci, LP. The next day, he sent one of his Quebec MPs, Emmanuel Dubourg, a Haitian himself, to Miami to deliver the message in person. I'm here to tell them exactly what uh, the Canadian immigration system is. And also, there is some misinformation here is circulating on uh, social media. So I'd like to rectify those uh, those information. Whether the message was received or not is unclear, but by the end of last week, Canada Border Services said the number of illegal crossings was in decline and the Cornwall tents were empty. We are in Canada very fortunate uh, compared to many parts of the world where we're a long way away. There are a lot of geographic challenges uh, as well as legal challenges, which means we do not receive the kinds of numbers of a, of a country like Germany, let alone countries like Turkey, um, where uh, they can be getting over a million refugees. Uh, obviously, the numbers are very small in the global perspective and fully within the capacity of Canada to manage. One group that has made its stance on immigration very clear is Quebec's La Meute. 
Members are vehemently opposed to illegal immigrants and use racist and derogatory language to describe immigrants online. But while far-right groups in the United States have been behind violent attacks, a recent demonstration by La Mute saw a twist of events. Jonathan Montpetit explains. Angry, frustrated group of racists uh, don't get to define who we are as a country. Quebec's far right was once pretty marginal and obscure, but is now stepping out of the shadows. And no group has attracted more attention recently than La Meute, the Wolf Pack. They are by far the largest group in the province, and maybe even the country. The group was formed in a sugar shack in the Beauce in 2015. Ex-soldier Patrick Baudry was one of the founding members. He now leads the group from his home in the woods north of Quebec City. Au début de la meute, à la création de la meute, qu'est-ce qui est arrivé? On était beaucoup plus sensible à l'islam radical et il y a eu la montée en puissance de Daesh. Il y a eu ensuite le flot migratoire de l'Europe euh, qui, qui nous a interpellés, qui nous a fait dire à nous, qui étaient trois anciens militaires au départ pour fonder la meute, que, attends une minute, ça ressemble à quelque chose qu'on connaît, ça, nous. La Mitte was first nothing more than a private Facebook group. Members shared their fears about radical Islam in Quebec, even though Muslims make up only 3% of the population. The Facebook page grew quickly. It now lists more than 43,000 members. The vast majority are from Quebec, though perhaps only 5,000 are active at any given time. They fundraise, organize speeches, circulate pamphlets and petitions, and hold protests. For many who join, it is the first time they meet others who see the world the same way they do. C'est toute une découverte quand tu découvres que, hein, wow, t'es pas seul, t'es pas seul. Il y a plein de gens et des gens qui se regroupent, puis qui se regroupent dans une belle atmosphère, qui se regroupent dans une atmosphère qui est saine. La Meute's main Facebook page is off limits to the public. Behind closed doors, members comment on Quebec politics and attack their critics. Sometimes they engage in conspiracy theories. Often they exchange Islamophobic memes or use racist language to speak about immigrants. It is illegal immigration, not radical Islam, that has dominated Lemut's discussion thread since late July. That's when the number of asylum seekers crossing illegally into Quebec jumped dramatically. Lemut's leaders want tougher border controls to stop the influx. Le Québec, le Canada, les frontières sont virtuelles. Euh, C'est qu'on va traverser les frontières illégalement, puis aucune conséquence. Vous allez s'accepter quand même. La population est enragée de ça. On le voit la réaction que ça fait. Lemut hoped by holding a protest in Quebec City they could bring that message to a larger audience. Around 400 members met first in an underground parking garage. But counter-demonstrators circled the building, blocking anyone from getting in or out. And while mass protesters tussled with police, La Meute stayed inside for five hours. When they finally emerged, they marched the National Assembly in silence and declared victory. We made a point. We made our point. Even anti-racism activists agreed. It's a great victory for the relations public for the Meute because of these dicasseurs who have not been able to sustain it. The protest was a critical moment for La Meute. It was the largest far-right gathering in the province in recent memory. It was organized, disciplined, and grabbed the public's attention. But with attention comes scrutiny. Scrutiny from politicians and an energized anti-racism movement. And more importantly, from ordinary Quebecers deciding on what values should inform public life in the province. Jonathan Mopitzi, CBC News, Montreal. Up next, Inuit stand guard over sunken historical treasures. In Toronto today, nearly a thousand women gathered women from kitchens, offices, factories, and schools. We know very well that we're at the bottom of the economic and the political pile, but not for long. International Women's Day commemorates an angry rebellion by women sweatshop workers in New York who walked off the job to win decent wages and working conditions. 
Today, the women's goals and demands are just as pointed. There's no excuse in the world for us being earning 60% of what men earn. That's an intolerable situation. As we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day. I mean, is it frustrating to you that a lot of people are simply not aware that today is International Women's Day? A lot of women are not aware. Well, sometimes it is frustrating, but on the other hand, uh, the celebrations have been growing from year to year. Uh, I mean, to have five or six thousand people out in the street in Toronto is quite a feat, let me tell you. For participants, the demonstration is a declaration of hope and belief that a different kind of society is possible. They're here because they don't accept that women are naturally inferior, passive and submissive. They don't believe women are born to be dependent. They don't think women are emotionally unstable, unable to make their own decisions. Twenty years ago, graduates grappled with the idea of careers. These young women assume they'll have careers and more. I want to try and have it all. I'd like to have an education and a, and a, a job that I'm happy with. We're not as radical. We're more equalists. Yeah. Like many young women today, these students say they're not feminists. On this International Women's Day, which celebrates the efforts of women to build a better world, they believe that world is here already. Pop superstar Alanis Morissette's homecoming is a big deal, if not a bit overwhelming for the city that knew her when. You can forgive the good people of Ottawa for not seeing it. They remember Morissette as a teenage dance queen with big hair and frosted lipstick who sang at the mall. Today, at her first press conference since she unveiled her new look, sound and record Jagged Little Pill, Morissette was asked to explain what happened to the dance queen. You know, the biggest changes that I went through personally were between the ages of 16 and 21, and I think it's inevitable it's going to come out in your music, so. And every time you Despite some people's confusion at her radical musical makeover, Ottawa's mayor proclaimed today Alanis Morissette Day and handed over the key to the city. <laughs> this just sort of represents that the city that I grew up in, that I went through so many things in, is, you know, is something that I don't want to really put in my past, really. I just want to make a peace with where I came from and, you know, I, I'm apprehensive to accept an Alanis Morissette day. I'll take an Alanis Morissette moment. She says her musical priorities and motives have completely changed. Over the last four years, just learned how, how to write for my own reasons and write for myself. And as I said, it's, it's pretty ironic that the moment I started doing that was the moment that most people related to it. If it wasn't for the Inuit uh, oral stories, it would be much harder to find the, uh, the wrecks. Inuit in Nunavut played a huge part in finding HMS Erebus three years ago. Oral stories led Parks Canada to the wrecks of Sir John Franklin's lost ships from his doomed 1845 expedition. Now, as Kate Kyle reports, Inuit in Joe Haven are acting as guardians of the historic site and sharing its history. Every few hours, Mark Ulikatak walks sections of Saunitalik Island, Inutitut, for the place of bones. Located on the Northwest Passage, the barren terrain is a short boat ride from Franklin's sunken ship, HMS Erebus. See if there's any sailboats coming through. No. That's what we're here for. Ulikatak is one of 17 Inuit hired to watch over Franklin's ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Part of their job is to report on any unauthorized activity in the area of the National Historic Site. It's the first to be co-managed by Parks Canada and Inuit in Nunavut. Being able to, to have people directly part, not only of the decision making, but part of the action. The degree of preservation um, is, is astonishing. Since Erebus's discovery in 2014, archaeologists have spent more than 250 hours exploring the wreck, recovering 64 artifacts and even DNA samples. 
The team plans to explore deeper into the ship and right into Franklin's cabin in the years ahead, cross-referencing any significant findings with Inuit oral history. Inuit will also be trained to help document new artifacts. And we want people to be able not only to see them, but to be part of learning about them and them uh, training them into, into directly participating in the research and the understanding of the story. With the steady decline of sea ice in the Northwest Passage, Parks Canada says the Guardian program will eventually host visitors to the site, sharing Franklin's story, but also how traditional Inuit knowledge helped piece it all together. The nearby community of Joe Haven is excited about the future of the Franklin site and any related tourism and jobs. It has a, an impact um, by hiring uh, local people in the community. If it wasn't for the Inuit uh, oral stories, it would be much harder to find the, uh, the wrecks. At least one cruise ship is adding the site to its itinerary. Passengers on board will hear from archaeologists and Inuit, each of whom will share their interpretation of this evolving Arctic mystery. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Saunita Lake Island on the Northwest Passage. And we'll be right back with a recap of our top story, Hurricane Irma's Path of Destruction. It's not fashionable these days to spend too much time or enthusiasm arguing that there are differences between men and women. We've spent a lot of time denying that any differences exist. You can get into a lot of trouble claiming anything else. I'd like to suggest there's an immutable universal truth, an undeniable behavior pattern that separates the sexes. It involves yogurt containers. Women save them, men throw them out. A lot of bands and parades like these represent police forces and cadet groups, things like that. This is the story of a different kind of band. Meet the Top Hat Marching Orchestra from Burlington, Ontario. In this parade, they're a little older, a little wiser, and a little lost. I've always been a little out of step with most of my colleagues who work in this racket called journalism. Most of my friends want to write for the front pages, want to chase the big stories. The stories I like best are the ones where there's no plot to begin with, no headlines, no news pegs. One thing you learn when you poke around off stage long enough is that people love to talk. Another thing you learn is that if you stick around long enough, and you listen hard enough, everyone has something worth saying. I owe you next. Oh, okay. <laughs> a, a Madagascar kissing cockroach. It looks like a beetle like a cigar, the end of a cigar. He's going to grow to be six inches, Peter, and you don't have to He's walk him. six inches, I don't know. And all you have to do is name him and watch him grow. <laughs> Get in there, you little sick cockroach. Stuart McLean. Thank you very much. In Moose Jaw. You know, the great British statesman Winston Churchill once said that success is going from one failure to another without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> but there's got to be a limit. I had a cow who couldn't learn her lines, a, a little girl who thought she was starring in a beauty pageant, the set wouldn't fit through the doors, Joseph was covered with scabs, <laughs> and I was worried that I was coming down with the chicken pox. So when I'm writing, uh, I, I, I'm always trying uh, to take people to the place of laughter, but also to uh, the place where laughter meets tears. Before we go tonight, a recap of our top story. Hurricane Irma has already torn through the Caribbean, destroying countless homes and leaving massive damage in its wake. At least 22 people are dead, and that number is expected to rise. This morning, the storm was downgraded to a Category 4 hurricane, but it's still packing 250 kilometer per hour winds. Some experts say Irma will regain speed and hit Florida this weekend as a Category 5 storm. 
More than five and a half million people in the state have been asked to leave, and officials say the time to do that is running out. That is The National for this Friday night. For news at any hour, including all the updates on Hurricane Irma, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Bonner. Thank you for watching.